Welcome to Analyst Talk with Jason Elder. It's like coffee with an analyst, or it could be whiskey with an analyst reading a spreadsheet, linking crime events, identifying a series, and getting the latest scoop on association news and training. So please don't beat that analyst and join us as we define the law enforcement analysis profession one episode at a time. Thank you for joining me. I hope many aspects of your life are progressing. My name is Jason Elder, and today our guest has 18 years of law enforcement analysis experience. She was an analyst with the British Transport Police and an intelligence trainer for over 20 countries. She specializes in open source intelligence and I2 analyst notebook. She is currently the VP of membership for the IACA. Please welcome Rachel Carson. Rachel, how are we doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much, Jason. It's a pleasure Uh, to be here. Very good. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to talk to somebody across the pond, as they say, <laughs> over in the UK. And Absolutely. I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. No, always a pleasure, Jason. You know that. All right. So this time of year, what's it, what's it like over in UK weather-wise? Oh, well, we've just had this most ridiculous heat wave. We, we took 40. And we, that's for the first time ever. Literally, like the the country was falling apart. We were, we had fires everywhere. Like the train oh. lines were melting. The air, like the runways at the airports, they were crumbling. Like they just could not cope with the heat. We're just not yeah. built for extremes. Like we can't do the snow and we can't oh, do the heat. And we don't have air con either. This is the thing, like in our houses, we're just not like, because we don't usually experience that kind of extreme heat. So yeah, we all kind of struggled for a couple of days, but it's cooler now. It is cooler, but we still haven't had any rain. So there are like droughts everywhere and it's just, yeah, a bit uh, manic. But, um... Yeah, man. Well, <laughs> it's, what is it, about four months and then it'll be cold. Oh, it'll be freezing. Yeah, we're yeah. living in our thermals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Never mind four months, it'll probably be four weeks. You know, that's how summer gone now. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I've been in parts of the country where August was cold, like a cold, you know, cold yeah, spell yeah. went through August, so. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Well, very good. Well, how did you discover the law enforcement analysis profession? Okay, so it was really by chance, to be honest. So I qualified as a mathematician and statistician originally, and so started off actually working in aviation. So I did a placement when I was at university in aviation with the National Air Traffic Services. And I was like modeling capacities of runways at airports, you know, Heathrow and Gatwick, which I absolutely loved, but I, it only lasted a year because it was sort of like a, a, like a placement year before I went back to do my final year of my degree. But then when I qualified, I actually started working with Virgin Atlantic as a marketing analyst, but I only did that for about a year because it, it wasn't so great. But then I spent three years conducting risk analysis for a, a fairly new insurance company here in the UK. And I was kind of like modeling claims, frequencies and severities and stuff like that. So I guess that started sort of opening my mind to the world of risk. But when I was doing doing that particular job, I actually used to spend two hours a day on the M25, which is the motorway, which sort of circles London. And all I had for company was the radio. And one day there was an advert on the radio and it said, do you have an analytical mind? Are you logical thinking? And I was like, oh, well, yes, I guess so. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, and it was the, the advert was actually for the new Independent Police Complaints Commission. They were recruiting investigators. And I was just like, that sounds so cool. So I applied. But unfortunately, so did 13,000 other people because it was a national <laughs> campaign. And sadly, I, I only got through to the second round. But what, what it did do was it got me thinking about the other ways of using my analytical skills. So I as I do, I started doing some research and discovered that in England and Wales, there was this it's a re- relatively new thing called the National Intelligence Model or the NIM. And what it was was a new model that all police forces in England and Wales were required to adopt. What it did was that it put analysts at the very heart of decisions within the police force and within intelligence led policing. So what I did was I started cold calling police forces. I was just sending them my CV and somehow or other, and I, I actually Honestly, I don't even know how, but my CV ended up on the desk of the HR team at the British Transport Police, which is the National Police for the Railways. And they gave me a call. And so they I invited me in for interview. And there was, I'm trying to, who was there? There was the head of analysis from the, well, what was then the National Criminal Intelligence Service. And then there was this guy with, I don't know, he had something on fancy on his shoulder, but I had no idea you know, about police <laughs> rank structure or anything like that. So I was completely oblivious as to, to who he was. And it turned out that he was the assistant chief constable. Oh, wow. Um, but I was just talking to him, like, you know, like I'm talking to you now. It was just, it was so, <laughs> it was 
was such a relaxed and just easygoing conversation. But anyway, we chatted for about an hour or so. And the next day they called me up and they just said, look, you know, cards on the table. We need somebody to come in and set up the analysis function within the BTP. And we can't afford to pay you that much because they were quite a poor force. They weren't home office funded. But they said, what we will do is that we will send you on every conceivable course that there is. And I was like 26 years old at the time. And I just thought, well, you know, why the hell not? You know, I've got nothing to lose, really. And I thought the training sounded really exciting. The role was just like the most incredible opportunity. So I accepted. And I basically spent three years essentially getting British Transport Police aligned with the National Intelligence Model, ensuring that we had analysts across right, you know, England and Wales and Scotland, actually, because it's a national force, all with the right skills, right training, the right tools. We set up processes for like what we call the tasking process, which is sort of critical within the national intelligence model to making sure that like decisions are being made at the right times with the right backup of you know the analysis backing it up and just really like embedded analysts within all of those processes you know so we had analysts in the major crime units and special branch and so on and basically so their analytical products were informing all our investigations and our all of our deployments and everything else so it was a super exciting few years if I've got to be perfectly honest and it just came about really purely by chance just because I heard this thing on the radio that got me sort of sort of thinking about it so yeah that was kind of how I stumbled into law enforcement yeah um, so and it's I, quite the so, journey since then <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're the first person that I've had on the show that told me that they discovered it through a radio ad <laughs> yeah, very that very surprise me. <laughs> Very good. All right. So a couple of follow-up questions to that. So you come from a background in mathematics. Mm, and, yes, for my sins. And yeah. so, and then you get to eventually weight risk doing, yes. doing the, the risk assessment. So is that really heavy math that, that yeah, you're yeah, dealing yeah. with and programs it was. And, and whatnot? Yeah, it, it was. So particularly when I was at the insurance company, I was doing this quite what I thought at the time to be really quite sophisticated multivariate analysis. So if you imagine, because at their insurance company, we did like car insurance and home insurance. And you know how when you apply for your insurance and you kind of, it asks you a lot of questions about, you know, what type of car you drive, the size of the engine, whether it's automatic or manual. And all of those questions are basically behind your answer to all of those questions. There's like a weighting. So depending on what your answer is, there will be a factor, a weighting factor that says that we're either going to charge you more or depending on the risk associated with that. And the risk is modeled based on the frequency of claims that are linked to that particular factor or the severity of claims. And by severity, you mean like how expensive it is to, to fix. So, yeah, there was a, a lot of modeling that kind of went on behind the scenes. And it was exactly the same when I was at National Air Traffic Services, because we used this sort of heuristic runway modeling sort of system to basically look at the optimum mix of aircraft because obviously aircraft all got different sizes and different engines and different speeds and have different sort of well they call it wake vortex I'm getting a bit technical now but it's like basically (laughs) like the turbulence that kind of results as a a, you know of an aircraft taking off and if you've got a big aircraft with a lot of wake vortex you have to wait quite a long time before the next aircraft can take off you know you couldn't have a little one taking off afterwards so you know there was yeah, there was a quite sort of sophisticated analysis behind all of this. But we're talking 20 odd years ago, and it's probably like a piece of cake now because you can probably do it with a big button. But at the time, it was, you know, it was really quite sort of specialist. And I, I was a bit of a maths geek, so I did quite enjoy it. Because yeah. <laughs> I, I do think that there's not enough metrics in law enforcement analysis, like key indicator. <laughs> it's funny you should say that because when I joined British Transport Police obviously I was straight up at the back of working for this insurance company and I tried to implement those similar kind of practices that I had I was looking at detection rates because one of the massive things for British Transport Police is we wanted to improve our detection rates so I started modeling our data to try and identify whether there are any kind of specific fact other than the obvious whether Mm -hmm. there are any specific factors that may contribute to us getting a detection you know whether it was the speed of the response to the incident or you know the type of questions that were asked and all that sort of thing and actually it did come out with some quite good results but the problem was was that actually it was just it was too complex like an actual concept for anybody to kind of grasp and I have to say actually my assistant chief constable of crime got it he was a super super smart guy he just he's amazing amazing man a huge amount of respect for him and he got it and he understood it but I think 
uh, unfortunately for the rest of the police force it was just a little bit at that time it was just too much to handle so it wasn't something that that we were able to continue unfortunately but but you know you're, you're right I think you know there's still so much opportunity for I guess more sophisticated analysis and innovation within within law enforcement yeah because it seems to me that we are still have the same metrics that we did 20 30 years ago mm. <laughs> it seems like we're still counting crimes. We're still measuring yeah. calls for service by average response time. And it seems like it's just the same thing. Yeah, and measuring satisfaction. <laughs> satisfaction with police. Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I, I mean, and considering the technology and considering how mm. many more people are doing the job and looking at this, it surprises me actually that yeah. there isn't more out there to to say and i get your point about it's complicated uh, and i and that's certainly something that's that's difficult because not only to use it you have to truly understand it mm, and, 100%, and i think and that's yeah. the, the probably the the big hill to climb but mm. it still to me surprises me that there's not more out there in terms of the the math yeah. into law enforcement analysis sure well there there was something that i developed i don't know if you know whether to sort of bring it up now but in terms of sort of one of my my badge stories where we developed the composite index as opposed to an actual just count and just sort of to give the the background to that so Basically, when I, I was head of intelligence analysis at Transport for London for eight years mm -hmm. and was basically responsible for the analysis which supported police units working on the entire transport system in London. So extended to buses and trams and cabs, as, as well as the sort of the rail network. And it was basically a partnership between the three police forces and Transport for London. And we were in a rather rare <laughs> but lucky situation in that we were very data rich. And again, one of the benefits of the national intelligence model is it creates a foundation for information sharing. So we had inf reciprocal information sharing agreements in place with all of our police partners. But the thing was, is that every data source that we had kind of told a different story due to the types of sources that they were and the way in which they were collected. They all you know, had their individual strengths and weaknesses. And sort of analysing each source in isolation didn't really make much sense because the results could be misleading. So, for example, we would have calls for service from the public, which would tell us one story. We would have recorded crimes, which would tell us a different <laughs> story. And then we would have things like reports from bus drivers. So they would see things and hear things and, and stuff that they mm -hmm. would tell us about. So they were TFL you know, operators that were reporting things. And then we would have fines from our revenue protection, like our ticket inspectors. So they're all like, I mean, that's just a selection, but they're all very different sources and they all told a slightly different story about the different types of criminality and antisocial behaviour. So basically the different types of risk that was affecting our transport system in London. So what I did was I set up a project to create a composite index which would effectively fuse multiple data sources to create a much more sophisticated and holistic picture of risk across the transport system in London. Now, in London, we have geographical boroughs, and these boroughs are broken down into smaller wards. And what we did was we calculated the composite risk of crime and antisocial behaviour affecting the transport system in London for every single ward. And there are over 600, I think, of them. So basically what we could do is we could create a, a choropleth map, which gave a much richer picture of comparative risk of crime and antisocial behaviour across London. And for each ward, we were then able, because we had all the figures behind it, we were able to describe what was contributing to that particular risk score in that particular ward. But not only did we do this, but we broke it down by hour of the day because the type and the extent of risk changes throughout the day. And, and what this did was it really helped to inform like things like just even like the default deployments of our officers. And basically, we, we ended up calling it the data clock. We essentially, you know, gave them 24 risk maps, you know, one for each hour. And this was and this is why I sort of would say that this is kind of my badge story, really, because it's probably one of the most impactful projects we did. You know, you and I know that absolutely everyone loves a map. And we gave them 24. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you and I also know that maps can often be misleading. But, you know, from a strategic perspective, because we have this kind of composite approach to assessing risk, it actually really helped the police teams that we were working with to kind of open their eyes to, I guess, to the value of analysis. And that's why it was like it was so important to me, because, you know, my career has very much been about, you know, 
ch- trying to sort of in- in- improve the, the the reputation, I suppose, of crime analysis and help other people to recognise the value. And this was one of those projects which which really did, because I say it really did open everyone's eyes to the value that the analysis could could offer. Yeah, was there aspects to the the risk modelling that surprised you? I think. I guess sort of the, the spread really in the variety, because I think, you know, people in many ways expect certain things to be in certain places. And that wasn't necessarily the case. It was a long, it was, it was quite a while ago. And I'm struggling to remember a little mm-hmm. bit, but I don't, I don't think there were many, I think because we were quite close to the data anyway. So well, we yeah. kind of understood things sort of independently, but I, I think just, just putting it together, the, the biggest surprise was I think the response to it. And I, I think that was probably the, you know, the, the best, the best thing that came out of it was just how well it was received. And it became part of our day-to-day work was that we were providing these, these maps or these data clocks out to, to our police teams um, yeah. but now i can't remember any specific specific yeah. sort of no yeah, and i i think it's usually one of the downsides that that i experienced when i was doing something similar to this is you take your analysis to the street officer the patrol officer and mm. they're gonna know yeah i know that i do that every day kind of thing yeah. and so they're i'm not bringing anything new to the table for it then. oh i see what you mean so surprises so, to them yes well yeah I, I yes no i do think there were surprises in that sense sorry i thought you meant from like from the analyst perspective but yeah no no, yeah. no no i think for them totally to sort of like understanding because i think prior to that they'd only seen things in isolation so i think to kind of put everything together and to it what it what it did was it essentially challenged a lot of their assumptions around mm-hmm. where they should be and when so yeah no from from that point of view it was definitely definitely effective but it did sort of result in a shift a lot of a lot of the default deployments to make sure that people were always in sort of the right areas at the right times you know based on this composite view of data rather than just looking at recorded crimes because if you, all you're doing is looking at recorded crimes or calls for service then yeah. you're not necessarily going to be there to support the revenue protection officer when they're dealing with an abusive you know, person who, you know, refusing to pay for a ticket. The other thing was we saw as a result of this was that we had a real shift from officers being deployed to like stops and stations to actually on the transport because mm. that was another one of the things that we uncovered there was that there were things that, you know we actually needed support teams on the transport you know on the buses and on the trains and on, on the underground rather than just being stationed actually at the physical stations and, and the transport hubs so that was a definite sort of change that we saw yeah that is fascinating and how is that recorded and and what i mean by that is if it, it can be quite difficult to narrow down the actual location of, <laughs> of of a crime that happens on public transportation yeah absolutely so it's interesting you say this because it's just one actually a technique that we developed which i ended up presenting at an ica conference back in 2014 so we we had that precise problem you know when you're dealing with transport related crime yes things will happen at stations and on platforms and and, and at bus, bus stops and things like that however there's an awful lot that happens on sort of en route and so people don't necessarily know where it happened and so what we did was we developed essentially like aoristic analysis but for location rather than time so we don't know where it happened rather than we don't know when it happened which is sort of what you do with like a burglary it happened mm-hmm. between you know eight and midnight or whatever yeah. so yeah so basically what what that involved was saying okay Somebody was a victim of theft between Victoria Underground Station and King's Cross Station. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe there are five stops or five segments, if you like, of of stops between those that between that sort of start and end location. You know, the person got on at Victoria, had their had their purse with them, got off at King's Cross and didn't. So it happens somewhere along those sort of along that line of route. So we would break that line of route up into five different segments and we would rather than just allocating a crime of one count to the end location or the start location, we would split it up into the five different segments. So we'd say there was, a, you know, 0.2 on that segment, 0.2 on that segment, 0.2 on that. Now that's how we started off. And then we would break that sort of down sort of thematically across that line of route. So we would then add up all of those segments <laughs> to see where the sort of the biggest risk was. Now, as we got more sophisticated, we brought in things like, okay, the time taken to go from one station to next, because of those five segments, one might be really long, one might be really short and, and so sure. on. So we, 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 we sort of made it a little bit more sophisticated over time, but that was kind of how it started. And again, that made a real impact because we were then able to direct 
the transport teams to the lines of route that were considered to be higher risk as opposed to the stations where we thought things kind of happened at the end maybe but we weren't quite sure so yeah so that made a made a big difference yeah and that was what you called hot, hot routes right yeah well hot routes as we hot call routes. it <laughs> yeah yeah I, oh, I, yeah that's that's, <laughs> that's right routes <laughs> 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 you got me you got me there <laughs> steve french uh, i think corrected me as well when i had him on the show so fantastic <laughs> <laughs> so yes all right well we're good because i i can see the impact because the report's taken it's taken at the station at one of the main stops probably and then yeah. the person's yeah. like well i got on here and then i realized it was gone by the time you know yeah I was going yeah, to get they, off and whether that's exactly. two stops or, you know, seven stops, yeah. that's, that's where you get the variety. Yeah, absolutely. And there's no, there's no value in telling a police officer that they need to be at an interchange. <laughs> yeah. you know I mean? <laughs> like, you know, at, at a major transport hub, like that just, that's just not going to help. You know, they've, yeah. they've got to be deployed to, you know, where, where the highest risk, you know, is considered to be. So yeah, yeah so that's so. what we, we did. We really had to adapt a lot of our sort of analytical techniques to sort of reflect the linear nature of the network that we were dealing with. So it was, it was, yeah. it was challenging, but exciting. Yeah. For the data clocks, mm. how far back did you go in terms so, of the set? Do you remember? Yeah. So what we did was we, we used two years worth of data and one of the factors that we built into it was change. So we would basically look at a year's worth of data in terms of assessing sort of the, the, the actual risk, the level of risk. And then we would compare it with the previous year to see whether there'd been an increase or, or a decrease. And so we, that was, again, one of the factors that we built into the, to the composite index. So, uh, yeah, we were very lucky in the sort of the data that we had available to us. We we're in a very sort of strong and fortunate position because we, we had all of our partners data as well as our own. So, yeah, we were, we were very data rich. Yeah. And we're so fortunate was... enough to be able to go that far back. So was the calculation for the index pretty complicated? Yeah. Oh my goodness. And we only had Excel. So <laughs> it was just like, we had like the most crazy Excel spreadsheets going on. So it was quite a mammoth task to, to actually sort of calculate. We did actually develop our own sort of bespoke analytical and reporting and mapping tool. So we integrated, well, we used Hyperion from like business intelligence point of view, mm -hmm. and we used a map info actually. And we sort of integrated that with our own intelligence database. So within that, we would sort of create all of our different layers and all of our sort of techniques. And we would then sort of be able to map them, you know, and things in map info all within the one system. So that was, that was super cool. But unfortunately for the composite index, it was considerably more sort of complex. And, and so, yeah, we had to, we had to do that in, in, in Excel. We could do with the maps, obviously in map info, we could bring everything in, but the actual sort of calculations yeah. were all running. Yeah. 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 And was there any major changes over time once you implemented it? Do you know what? I don't know because I left. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't know but but you know we on sort of on the ground there are always sort of those sort of success stories because we we did a lot of because being this kind of partnership and it was one thing that you know actually as an agent as an organization Transport for London are very very good at and that's sort of bringing together all of the right organizations so and because we had this very local view of things, what we was able to do is when there was a particular problem, like a, a highlighted problem location, we wouldn't just work as a, as a police you know, agency or police teams to kind of deal with it. We would bring in all the local businesses and the council and, and everything else as well. And so we really, really adopted like a significant problem solving approach to all of these things. So, you know, when we would discover that like all of the nightclubs were rolling out in a particular you know, location at a particular time, and that would then that was then flooding the transport transport system like the buses to get home like the night buses to get home mm. and that sort of thing you know we could just work with the nighttime establishments to you know separate their rollout times so they all closed at different times of, of the evening and that then prevented that kind of overload to the transport system so there was less violence and you know less sort of disorderly behavior all at the same time so there was a real you know this kind of problem solving approach that was was, was adopted you know which did see really good results in that sense yeah, I always find those problem solving measures fascinating because it's interesting <laughs> when when you really can get change through a very simple, simple task. 
Oh, I know. I know. It, it really, it, time and time again, you see the difference that these little things can make. Uh, you know, and even sometimes just like just talking to like the ambulance drivers and like hearing what they're getting from the people that have been beaten up because, you know, <laughs> they just rolled out of a club. And, you know, it's, it's the insight that you can get from these things that you wouldn't ordinarily get by just looking at a crime report. So it really does sort of, sort of demonstrate the value of, of doing this kind of partnership work and problem solving, you know, as a, as a collective. Paige, how are we doing? I'm very well, Jason. How are you? Very well. Tell our audience a little bit about ACIA. Sure. Okay, so ACIA is an association of crime and intelligence analysts, and it's a community of members from the UK and Ireland. And we encourage all our members to challenge how and why things are done within the intelligence sector. So what is this ACIA New Horizons podcast going to be about? So it's going to be topic based. So we will be speaking with individuals with diverse backgrounds who all work within the intelligence field. It's to provide a support network to improve analyst developments and to create sort of a critical mass to help implement change. So you will be able to find the ACIA New Horizons podcast on our website. That is www.laapodcasts.com or wherever you get your podcast. And then Paige, one last question. What are your words to the world? Be open-minded and allow me to network and promote the profession. Hi, this is Steve French and I have a message to you about language. Language is really important when you're doing your job. For instance, it isn't a zucchini, it's a courgette. It isn't a lobby, it's a foyer. It isn't Z, it's Z. Buses go on routes, not routes. And it is never, ever made out of aluminum. So I want to talk a little bit about the national intelligence model framework. Mm. You said you got into that and that seems to Mm. me like that's something very different from Mm. what you were doing previously up to this point in your career. And it's (laughs) more, it's, it's not just math that you're dealing with anymore. Now this, there's this whole, whole framework, this whole model that you're establishing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, it it was, it was a complete sort of left, right, a left turn Mm -hmm. at the traffic lights from my perspective, because Essentially, I mean, the national intelligence model, it's got this fancy name, but it's basically just a business model for decision making. That's mm-hmm. that's essentially all it is. It operates at three different levels. So there's sort of the local level, there's a regional level, or sort of, I say regional level, it's become different for national, but it was different for the British Transport Police because we were a national force. But generally for a for one of the, the regional forces, you would have sort of a local level, you would have a force wide level, and then you would have a cross border level which would then take you into the jurisdiction of, of other of other sort of police agencies and obviously international as well. And what it does is it sets this framework for decision making. So you have like a tasking process at both the tactical and both the strate- and, and a strategic level. So the tactical level would basically mean every one to two weeks, and it depends on the force, every one to two weeks, there would be an assessment of all of the intelligence that's been received. And you would then basically present the so like emerging findings from that, from that intelligence assessment and you would put it to a tasking meeting a tactical tasking meeting and there would be key decision makers at that meeting that would basically go okay right thanks for this as a result of this we're going to do xyz we're going to put a team out at this location at this time we're going to put a team out at this location this time and, and so on and the, all those decisions would be made now at that point if there was any specialist resources that were required to tackle something or if there was actually an emerging threat which appeared to be wider than just a local problem then that would get taken to the next level up sort of tasking meeting. So what I described so far was like the local one and then but then there was a force wide one as well. And they would they would then hold the, the keys, if you like, to unlocking more specialist resources and sort of force wide resources. So that would be done at a sort of a tactical level. And so that would inform the next week or two weeks deployments. And but what also would happen is there may be the analysts would be commissioned to do extra pieces of work. So if there was an emerging crime series or, you know, evidence of sort of repeat victimization or anything like that, then the whoever was chairing the tasking meeting would basically say to the analyst, right, OK, I would like to commission you to conduct a problem profile, for example, or a subject profile. And these are key templates which are defined within the national intelligence model. And they're a really thorough, in-depth assessment of all of the intelligence surrounding either a problem or a person or a group of people. And so the analysts would then go away and they would do their thing and they would bring it back to the next 
um, tasking meeting. And then off the back of that, there would be recommendations and then the decision makers would be there to basically say, right, OK, as a result of this, we're going to do surveillance on this. We're going to do X, Y, Z. So it was really like this kind of whole process where the analysts beat the decision making process. And that operated sort of on this sort of tactical level. Now, obviously, on a day to day basis, they were feeding into daily intelligence briefings and things like that, because obviously there are some things that you can't leave to, for two weeks and things like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It still kind of provided that kind of sort of that framework for tactical decision making. But then at the strategic level, it was very much looking kind of like looking to the horizon, looking, saying, OK, what are our biggest threats? What are the biggest sort of long term changes and what things do we need to be mindful of that's changing? You know, is there kind of an emergence of, of hate crime or is there an emergence of cyber crime and, and things like that? And if so, what parts of those are likely to affect us as a force? And therefore, what resources are we going to need? You know, what do we need to be equipped with in order to tackle this effectively going forward? You know, do we need to like relook at the way our resources are aligned? You know, at the moment, we've got 20 percent of our resources here. We've got 30 percent of our resources here and we've got 50 percent of our resources here. Is that appropriate given the level of risk or should we actually move some of that 50 percent into where we've only got 20 percent because actually they're seeing an increase in something else? So it was kind of taking this whole kind of holistic view of like, are our resources balanced? versus, you know, are we equipped to, to tackle the, the sort of the challenges that are likely to happen in the future uh, or that we're likely to have to deal with in the future. And again, so the analysts were really at the heart of all of this and were really driving this, this kind of process. And so, yeah, so that's kind of like effectively the national intelligence model. It's all about sort of having this dis- tasking and decision making process at tactical and strategic levels at every like at local like regional and national and international levels and it just to me I mean I'm maybe it's because I'm a maths geek but I don't know how many times I'm going to say that in this podcast (laughs) but but I love like structure and frameworks and I'm a real kind of stickler for kind of working within those things I mean I'm I'm open to flexibility obviously as well but but I love having that kind of process in place and and for me you know the national intelligence model worked really well you know there are lots of people who don't like it and find it too kind of limiting and restrictive but in my view then they They just need to open their eyes in terms of like what else, you know, how they can adapt it to suit their purposes. You know, the way that we've adapted some of the traditional crime analysis techniques to, you know, represent the the crimes that we were experiencing on the transport system. We can adapt the model to kind of fit our resourcing and the the teams that we've got available and and everything else as well. So, yeah, I think it's for me, it was it was superb and it gave me an excellent framework to help to prepare British Transport Police to really make sure that they were fully intelligence-led. Hmm. Yeah, because unlike the United States, there's one police department over there. So when you're talking about this model and you're talking about yeah. local, regional, how often would it come from top-down that initiatives or directives? Or are these local given the flexibility to to work with more cust- in a more customized way? So I, I think, it, to be honest, it worked kind of both ways because there was a really good sort of communication channel because the sort of the level one would work up to level two but so local would sort of work its way up to the sort of the force wide but then equally if the force identified a priority at that level two they would then sort of report that back down to level one and say right this is what you want to be doing Mm -hmm. and you know and when we were sort of the recommendations and things that were coming out they were always for sort of prevention intelligence and enforcement and also reassurance we kind of added reassurance sort of so after a few years and that really sort of set like the intelligence requirement for for the whole force so we were basically we would set out priorities for like okay when this happened like this is a part so say I don't know, cycle crime is a theft for us. It is is a priority for us. Cycle theft is a priority for us. We would then say, okay, so these are priorities. When you are called to a theft of bike, these are the questions that we want you to ask. This is the information that we want you to collect. And these are things you've got to put into our intelligence system and evaluate because that's what we want to be analyzing. So, you know, so that would come down from, from the top. But usually things would only really come down from the top when the level ones have basically gone, okay, we're experiencing this emerging issue. Um, So it was a real kind of like reciprocal thing. And I think what was also really, really powerful about the national intelligence model is that all UK police, well, England and Wales police forces had adopted this. And so what that meant was that we all kind of spoke this common language. We were all evaluating information in the same way. We were all talking about problem profiles, subject profiles, tasking processes, tactical and strategic, level one, two, three. We all had exactly the same language. So when there was a cross-border issue, which of course there is all the time because crime crosses jurisdictions and, you know, boundaries, you know, as as naturally as, as it would do, it meant that we could talk to other police forces and say, look, 
you know, have you got a problem profile on this person? What intelligence have you got? Well, how have you evaluated it? Oh, you've evaluated it the same way as us. Brilliant. And so we can use it in the same way as we would anything that we've kind of created ourselves. So it was really like powerful in, in that sense. Yeah. And I'm just thinking about the data too. So the data <laughs> was probably standardized as well and easily mm-hmm. to be merged. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Yeah, because I was talking to you yesterday during the prep call, and I said, well, that's that's funny. If you ask the police department here <laughs> in the U.S., if you ask the detective unit for the same report and then maybe the patrol unit for the same data, you're going to probably get two totally different looks and feel to the report. <laughs> and that's just one department, and there's 17,000, 18,000 departments in the United States. So you're... <laughs> You know, the data that you're talking about getting yeah. standardized is, would be very messy if we try to gather all that for the states. <laughs> yeah, no, I feel we're very lucky. I don't know what the current count is. I think we're 42, 43 police forces in the UK. And so we're, yeah, I'm also, not obviously not that many, but still enough. Yeah. You know, if you're talking yeah. a different language, you need is two to cause a yeah. problem when you're talking different languages and, and getting different kind of analytical sort of products out of them. So, yeah, we're very yeah. fortunate in that sense. Yeah. And you mentioned it. What was the criticisms of the model? Oh, I think it was, it's sort of this, you know, police officers that have always gone on there sort of, I've been, I've been doing this job for 30 years. I know Mm -hmm. where the problems are. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I know my, I know my offenders. I know what to look for. I go with my guts, you know? And so, and, and, you know, and I don't diss that because I think there is, there is a huge amount to learn from that sort of historic kind of knowledge and understanding and and experience. I, I don't diss that at all, but I think what it meant was there's sort of been a real challenge culturally in embedding a process which and you've got to remember that analysts are civilian here sure and, and and a lot of and particularly back in sort of the early sort of 2000s were fresh out of university you know so when you've got somebody that's 30 years in the job you know and you've got a 22 year old analyst who's been doing this for six months saying right I know you've been going here like every Friday night for the last however long but actually we'd kind of like you to kind of go around the corner or perhaps like a different stop or station or whatever then so you know it it was a real like hang on a minute who are you to tell us <laughs> you know what this is and, and I think yeah, just the process of having regular meetings and stuff was like oh we've never had to do this before so it was just it was a change in behavior that's you know really over the last sort of 20 years has really sort of taken time to <laughs> kind of progress I suppose so I think that was a lot of it was a lot of this kind of resistance sort of initially to like, you know, we've not had analysts before, we've not needed them, we've done our job perfectly well, so why should we need them now? But, you know, we're in a, we are in a better place now. I wouldn't say it's perfect, but we are in a better place now. And I think because what's happening now with police training, you know, so that when they come out sort of fresh from their police training is that they're, they're taught about the national intelligence model and the benefits and how to work with analysts and everything else. So, you know, you've got to remember that 20 years ago that never happened. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it was it was a very different kind of sort of situation that they were were working within. So, yeah, yeah. It's, it's better now, certainly. <laughs> well, you know, and, and talking about, you know, you turn into an instructor and I know one of the mm-hmm. things you focus on is the capabilities of the analyst, the professionalization mm-hmm. of the analyst and the, fa- the idea of the analyst being a salesperson, right? Yes. And it, So it's interesting to me because you could have a very good idea. You could have a very good product, but Mm. if it's pitched the wrong way, it's never, it's, it's going to be difficult to go anywhere. And it's almost, it reminds me a little bit of what you were talking about in the beginning where you had this, this model that was really complicated that would have worked, but it was so hard to pitch that you couldn't get it get it to go go anywhere and so i think the same thing with analysts is yeah you are going to be put in a situation where you're talking to someone that has a lot more experience than you hundred percent, and you are going to have to pitch to them why they should do what you're asking them to do yes Uh, absolutely and this is why so i as you mentioned earlier i conduct analysis training And I don't run an analysis course without running a a lesson on communicating with impact. And, you know, because I've met so many phenomenal analysts who just simply can't get across their message. 
Mm. And, and it's such a waste. It is such a waste because I just think if only you could get your voice heard mm. and, and understood and really, you know, back up your, your findings and, you know, justify why you're making these recommendations then you could, you know, make such a difference. And so, you know, I, I really sort of talk about sort of speaking from the heart, being knowledgeable, grounding yourself. And just sort of having that as, as much kind of impact as you can when you talk to get your message across and to keep at it, you know, yeah. not to give up because you're going to hit resistance. You know, there's, yeah. there's, there is no analyst in this, on this world who, who's ever, you know, not hit some kind of resistance. But if you, you've got that sort of genuine belief and passion and you can back everything up and prepare yourself for what challenges and questions they're going to give you. You know, if, if you can come back with really solid, strong answers, then, you know, they're far more likely eventually to sit back and go, do you know what, actually, you've got a point, and maybe we should listen to you. And, and, and nothing happens overnight, but you've got to keep chipping away at it. And I like say, just get your message across so that you can actually, you know, make that, make that difference, as corny as it sounds. Yeah, no. And it's, it, that's where it can be a little bit easier if you are working as part of an analytical unit and yeah. you have a team there where you could bounce yeah. ideas off of and, yeah. and practice and get different perspectives on questions you may get that yeah. you don't yeah. anticipate. And that's when it can be helpful instead of being mm. an analyst all just one analyst at a department and you're trying to implement something like this I, I think teamwork in the analytical field is one of the most important things I have to say and I feel sorry for those who are just like you know we don't have it here in the UK because we've got obviously got like larger agencies and, you know and mm -hmm. what have you but you know in the US where I hear of just like one analyst per department I just my heart kind of goes out <laughs> to them because like I benefit so much from bouncing things off other people you know mm -hmm. and, like every team that you work with that you have like a different different makeup and different backgrounds so you know everybody automatically has got these some sort of different sort of neurological reflexes that basically when you say something it triggers a different idea and yeah. there is so much value in I would hate to work in isolation yeah. I really would I really would there are a lot of situations where you'll see an analyst as a sole analyst at a department but he or she will do a really good job of reaching out and networking with neighboring agencies yeah and to not be uh, totally alone and yeah. but there are still a lot of analysts out there that I feel aren't doing enough networking for whatever mm. reason and mm. I think they are definitely missing out on mm. the, the potential of networking and what the the value of networking can bring them they just need to join the IACA there you that's go all it is. yeah <laughs> well, that's true that's true <laughs> You're right. Yeah, and we'll get to that here in a second. So I mentioned in your intro, you, you do a lot of training on I2 mm. Analyst Notebook. I and do. for a short period of time in my career, the analogy could be I2 was to the intelligence analyst as GIS was to the crime analyst. Right. And, okay. and there was certainly, there was times when I was an intel analyst that I would spend every day in I working. From your perspective, then, what do you see is the the big value for analyst notebook and for maybe somebody that's not familiar with it okay yeah no absolutely for, for me there's, there's there's a few things i suppose really one is the being able to identify patterns and really break down particularly bulk data mm -hmm. uh, because i think you know increasingly we are as analysts are dealing with bulk data sets and, you know, to find that needle in the haystack, you know, to identify the anomaly, the pattern, the, you know, you know, the thing that the, the key finding that really stands out is really hard when you're just dealing with, you know, more traditional tools, you know, whether it's Excel or, 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 or something else. So I think, you know, the thing with I2 is it provides you that capability to break the data down and identify those patterns and look for the flows and the connections and the relationships and things like that, which may not necessarily be easy to understand from a spread. But I think the also the also power obviously comes in the visualization aspect as well. And I think 
in fact, what I see most is I2 being used for visualization as opposed to analysis. Now, it's capable yeah. of doing both if you've got the right skills and the right tradecraft to use I2 effectively, because there's a lot of analytical features within the tool. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't necessarily use them or are scared to use them or don't quite know what questions to ask of the data. So therefore, don't quite know which of the analytical features to use. So I think a lot of people just focus on the visualization side of I2 and it is incredibly powerful as a visualization tool and I know it's used in a lot of intelligence briefings you know very very powerfully because it, it helps with that sort of communication getting the message across of like what the intelligence is telling us and therefore what we should do now but I say the analysis side is an area where and it's something that I build into sort of the training that I do in the sense of like we really want you to understand sort of the analytical tradecraft within a particular use case so, you know, whether it's financial crime or whether it's people looking at, you know, telephone, you know, analysis, you know, call data records and things like that, it's like, what is a tradecraft to find out the answers to your key questions? You know, if you've got tracking data, you want to know where there's been a, a an unusual stop that you wouldn't perhaps expect, or, you know, if there's if it's call data, you know, where's that un, un, unexpected call or where the pattern in calls, you know, and, and I too can, can help you answer all those kinds of questions. If you've got sort of, if, if you've got the right skills and tradecraft to understand which of the analytical features to use within, within the tool. So, yeah, so there's kind of, there's the visualization side, but there's also the analysis. And I will say that I too, and this notebook premium as well, they're also bringing in a lot of additional data sets now. So they're providing so the gateway, if you like, as a connector to other external data sets. So, you know, whereas, you know, say people perhaps use Dun & Bradstreet data or Moody's data or Shadow Dragon, for example, you can actually now connect to those data sets through I2. So rather than running something separately in one, in one system and then importing it into I2, you can actually access it automatically and you can run that search through the I2 Analyst Notebook Premium. So, you know, for me, that's that's incredibly powerful because you you get instant access to that data and I guess it in increases or accelerates I should say that the time with which analysts can reach their findings and, and everything else because they're not having to sort of do that additional step in the analysis process. Yeah because I had gentleman Kyle McFactridge on the show it's been a couple of weeks now and he was talking about social network analysis mm. and 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 I feel that just to what you mentioned about the visualization, I feel yeah. that analysts are using I2 to do timelines and link charts. And, right. and that's, there's not really a lot of science behind that. And I think that's <gasps> unfortunate. Um, yeah. That's r really what they're using it for. And th that I gets know. back to my first you know, yeah. issue that I told you about it, that there's not enough uh, yeah. key indicators in their profession. Well, I think yes. there's, there's not a lot of uh, science, I think, mm -hmm. going into a lot of these tools that analysts mm -hmm. have access mm -hmm. to. I think the, the social network analysis is a prime example of that. It is. And I mean, I too has the social network analysis capability and the science is all embedded within it, you know, and the, the calculations are not straightforward. In fact, I've presented how it works at a previous IACA, you know, in terms of all of the different sort of centrality measures and how they're calculated and, and, and why they all have sort of the different sort of means, whether it's centrality or, you know, the others as well. So it, the, the, the science is kind of there, but I think the problem is, is it, it is so complicated. And I know I, I had a mathematical background, but actually the, the traditional crime analyst doesn't have that scientific kind of mathematical background. I know there are obviously those that have, but a, a lot of people don't come, you know, direct from a mathematical background. So it is quite complicated to understand, you know, like, what is degree centrality? What is, you know, and all, <laughs> all of that sort of thing. So I think, you know, there's, there's a way that we need to go from a, from a training and education point of view for crime analysts in terms of helping them to understand this, because there's huge value in social network analysis. You want to know who, you know, the leader is, who the gatekeeper is, you know, mm -hmm. who's got most access to information. Just because they have critical, you know, things that you need to understand if you want to dismantle the network, you know, if we want to, you know, or, you know, I can't think of a word at the moment, I've completely lost, lost my train of thought. <laughs> but, you know, if you want to sort of to, to, like, intervene at some point, you, you need to understand who all of these particular key players are and what the relationships are within the network and and that does exist within i2 but i think just there's this lack of understanding and and, and i think i2 in a way have been 
sort of have, have caused this because actually it's really easy to run a social network analysis in IT. You have a chart and you hit the, the go button pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and you get these numbers out and you go, well, this is the degree measure and this is the other measure. And, and, but nobody then really knows what that means. And, and then if a police officer will challenge an analyst and go, so what does that number actually mean? It's really hard for them to explain that. And so you know, I think there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done within the crime analysis community in terms of helping them to understand what all of those sort of so centrality measures actually mean and how to articulate them so in an understandable way, you know, so that, you know, the teams that we're working with can actually act upon it with confidence, because that's ultimately what it's all about. Hi, this is Steve French, and I have a little phrase for you to remember. A phrase that stuck with me throughout my time as an analyst is a quote from Sherlock Holmes. When you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Hey, this is Don Reby. I'm here with Jason Elder on Analyst Talk, and I want to share with you that there is a new book coming out for supervisors called Building a Crime Analysis Legacy. This is a law enforcement supervisor's Roadmap to building long lasting high quality analytical capacity. August 10th is the day that it comes out. Don't miss out tools, strategies, everything you need to build quality analytics is in this book. So be sure to get your copy on August 10th. Before we get to the IACA, I I do want to talk about open source community. Mm. And cause I know that's a, I know that's a passion <laughs> of, of yours. So I don't really have a question for you. I just <laughs> wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about open source and just okay. let you go. Thank you. So I stumbled into open source when I was working at Transport London, because one of the things that we kind of heard about, but didn't really have much data to support was that a lot of people, women in particular, but not exclusively, were becoming victims of sexual offences whilst travelling on the transport system. So whether it's the underground or the buses, and, you know, there could be different levels of of sort of different types of of sexual offence. But the problem was, is that our crime data just did not support any of that. You know, and this comes back to the fact that, you know, we've got all these different data sources all telling us different things, but we, we didn't have much that told us that this was actually a, a big issue. So what we decided to do was take to social media, because while somebody doesn't necessarily report something to the police, they might tweet about it or they might you know, put something on their social media. And lo and behold, we started to uncover all sorts of incidents where you know, people were being touched, they were being filmed, they were being groped, you know, all sorts of things that were happening. And so, you know, we were starting to build up a a better picture of the sort of the risk of sexual offence on the transport network just through social media, which was just, I mean, this is crazy. This must have been sort of 2012, I'm thinking. So it must have been a good sort of 10 years ago now. Yeah. And back then, this was really the sort of the first time we'd really used social media for this kind of purpose and it was you know obviously use it for sort of investigations and stuff but for actually identifying where there were emerging problems this this was a really sort of new thing and so that got sort of that sort of I guess sparked my interest if you like in social media and and open source intelligence and from there on in I've pretty much just been self-taught because I loved it I absolutely loved sort of what you could do with with open sources and I follow literally and my Twitter is just I literally (laughs) follow (laughs) the entire OSINT community and you know and uh, so I've yeah I I describe myself now as a complete OSINT geek it's like my my first port of call for everything to do you can and I think what's so incredible about OSINT as well is that it's gone from being this source which everybody considered to be massively unreliable and you know it's just too vast you can't you know, you can't get any value from it. And, and anyway, it's all fake. It, but actually, it's really transitioned, and particularly over the last few years. And I think, you know, where we've seen things like, you know, the Trump campaign, the Capitol riots, and actually sort of the, the recent invasion uh, of Ukraine, actually, OSINT is now being used as a, as a fantastic and a critical tool for, you know, picking out sort of misinformation and disinformation. It's actually being used to, you know, to validate things rather than being assumed that it's that it's un, unreliable. So, you know, I'm delighted because, you know, I think there's been this real sort of sea change. And I think OSINT as a, as a discipline really now stands up against all of the other, 
you know, intelligence gathering discipline. Because yeah. I think before it was always that kind of poor relation, wasn't it? Whereas mm-hmm. now it's up there with human and and and, sign and everything else. So yeah, it, it's been on a big journey, and I, I use it for a lot of different purposes. Obviously for sort of criminal in, in investigations, but I've used it for conducting due diligence. So I've used on sort of people for vetting purposes, or I've used it to help companies with their investment choices. You know, uh, there's there's been a whole like host of of reasons that I've that I've utilized it and and I think what I love well there's two things I love about probably more than that but two particular things I love about the OSINT community and that's one that it's always changing it's always evolving and so there are always new tools and techniques to learn and I like things on Twitter practically every day that I just think gosh that's an exciting new tool we could do you know I can use that for this that and the other so that's really cool but also I love the way that the OSINT community share you know there is so much freely available you know people dedicate their lives you know to developing these tools and managing these tools and maintaining them for the benefit of other people you know and the OSIC community does so much for good you know in terms of you know helping to identify and find locate missing persons and and everything else and I just you know I just I love being a part of that it's just it's yeah it's just a wonderful community. So do you have maybe favorites recent tools that you recommend? Oh gosh so I Yes. And so I, I love the tools because they make everything a lot sort of quicker and easier in many ways, but I'm also quite a traditionalist in the sense I like to do things myself. So very often, oh my Google Docs, I am just addicted to Google Docs. <laughs> I, I use it for everything. Literally, you know, if I'm looking for something in a website, I'll go straight to uh, like the site doc and, and just look, I won't bother going straight to the website. I just go site colon and then the domain and then whatever word I'm looking for, you know, so I use those kind of things sort of all the time. I will use Intel Techniques is just recently back up. Oh my goodness. That's just life changing. Mm-hmm. So Michael Bazell's Intel technique, I used to use it all the time. And then he sort of went sort of subscri- subscription only for a period of time, but has just in the last, literally the last couple of weeks, made it available again to everyone. And obviously, you know, social media and things like that have changed. So in that period of time, terms and conditions have changed in terms of like what, what you can access. So some of the tools are a little bit different, but oh gosh, it's just like, it's brilliant to have that that back again. I think the other thing that I've, I've got so much value from just recently is breach data. So either hashed or is it snuff space? I can't remember. I don't, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but I use both. And so what I will do there is if I'm looking at a person of interest, I will search, for example, their name initially and see what it gives me. And obviously, if it's a common name, that's a nightmare. But if it's a more unique name, then it gives me some like mm-hmm. some really good starting points. And it might give me some email addresses or dates of birth or IPs or, or other you know personal identifiers or password. Um, but then if I've got a, an email address, I will pivot on that. So I'll then search for the email address and see what that gives me. And let's just say it gives me a hashed password. I'll then search on the hashed password because people use the same password, like so many accounts. <laughs> so if somebody's used that password, for one thing, they're likely to be likely to find them for another. So I will then like iterate again and search for that ha- hashed password. And I just keep going until I run out of options. And it's like this massive sort of iterative process. And the amount I can uncover just through breach data. So this is basically like, imagine like you have got an account with Amazon, for example, and Amazon experience a data breach. And that data then appears on the dark web. Then that will, it is basically it's up for sale. Then that will be available through tools like Dehashed. And so, and it's for a very sort of I think reasonable subscription I can't remember the latest I don't know it's like $15 a month or something you can basically access all of this and it's it's just phenomenal I mean it's brilliant just from a personal level because you you can run through your own identifiers you know you're sticking your phone number your email address your address your name you know put, and even putting your passwords and you can then see if any of your data is is visible and if it is you then you know you've got to change all of that stuff <laughs> Yeah. But from an investigative point of view, I've, I've uncovered so much that I would never have found, literally never have found if it wasn't for, for those tools. So yeah, they're, they're absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I just, it boggles my mind how much access to data we have. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know. All right, you talked about open source intelligence. I was talking with David Karen's former CIA officer. And mm. he started in the, in, you know, 50 years ago, right? And he's dealing with newspaper articles. <laughs> That's, that was his open <laughs> oh source goodness. intelligence. And then it got to 
TV programs maybe that you had access to and then video cameras came available and so maybe you got access yeah. to to that <laughs> that media but now social media is just a is a whole branch to itself it is. and it, it really is it's yeah. it's amazing to me how much data we have access to and because mm. you could spend every analyst could spend their entire day probably on Twitter and Facebook if they yeah, want it to. Easily, but, easily. And it would be legitimate work. Yeah. Oh, ab absolutely. But this is where tools like, you know, OSINT Combine and Scope Now and things like that, that's where those kind of tools really, really come into to their own because they really help analysts to find and filter and collect the relevant information. So, you know, rather than just going in raw with, you know, your Facebook, your Twitter and, and your Google and, and everything else, you know, it, it really, they really do help. These kind of tools really, really significantly help you to sort of filter out the noise and just focus on exactly what's what's relevant to what you're looking at. And, and you can also set up your kind of your monitoring and, you know, things like that so that, you know, if you want to be alerted to any time somebody says this particular phrase, then, you know, you can get that kind of, those kind of reports on a you know, on an hourly daily basis or whatever is required so you know that's where those kind of tools really come into their own, their own. you know they're sort of like they're just they're like gold for, for you know for the intelligence analysts in that sense yeah so we will put uh, links in the show notes for these open source sources that Rachel just discussed cool. if for the, for those that are interested in learning more about what Absolutely. she just described all right, so let's move on to the IACA now. Yeah. And as as I mentioned in your intro, you're currently VP of membership. And uh -huh. and so, but I guess so let's just maybe talk first of how you started with the IACA. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, so it was actually through Christopher Bruce, who was former president and, and vice president of the association. I think he's been vice president of administration and vice president of I think well. I think he's been all but treasurer, I think. Yeah, he has. He really has. So basically, this was back in, I want to say 2013, 2014, probably. So I was working at Transport for London and my director at the time, he uh, met Christopher on a trip to the United States and he at the time he learned about the uh, DDAX program which is data-driven approaches to crime and traffic safety. Now at this same time it, it was just like pure coincidence that the Met Police their transport unit and their traffic units were both merging and what that meant from our point of view was that our remit was extending to road collisions so whereas Previously, we just sort of focused on you know, the, the safety on the transport network. We were extending to road collisions. And so basically what happened was my director invited Christopher over to London to have a look at our processes, review everything that we were doing just to help us embed traffic safety into everything that we were doing. Now, we were also looking at congestion because that was another remit of ours because we wanted to keep London moving. That was sort of our motto at the time, but then it was keeping London moving safely. So it kind of all, all kind of evolved a little bit. But anyway, so Christopher came over to London and he spent, I think it was a week or so with us just to reviewing everything. We, you know, he came to our comp stat, he came to our tasking meetings and, and everything else. Now he was vice president of membership at the time uh, of the IACA. And so of course, doing his bit to help grow the international sort of membership of the association, he invited myself and my team to join the IACA, which of course we duly did. As I mentioned earlier, this hot roots technique that we de developed, you know, whilst Christopher was in London, we showed him this technique and he essentially uh, invited me to the conference in Bellevue, Washington. This, and it was, it was 2014. So essentially presents the, the technique in the traffic track, which I think was the first time that the IACA in the conference mm -hmm. had run this kind of track. And so it pretty much went from there. So obviously being from the UK, I initially joined the International Outreach Committee and then later took on the role of the chair of that committee. And then, yeah, back in 2019, was lucky enough to be elected as vice president of membership and taking over from Christopher, actually, because that was then the end of his of his period as, as vice president. So that was, but yeah, that was in, in 2019. And I now feel incredibly privileged to be working alongside, you know, the board. They're all fantastic. You know, I consider them all my family, even though I've not seen them since yes, I became well, vice president. Yeah, <laughs> well, I was going to mention that. We got the conference coming up and you know, unfortunately okay. due to covid you have not been able to attend no. the conference so this is the year that you all get to get to be together 
Um, absolutely absolutely i I just yeah i just want to do the whole kind of group hug thing because we (laughs) literally they've all got together like you Mm -hmm. know the other four of the board you know quite Mm -hmm. regularly Mm -hmm. Um, and we we have obviously these very frequent meetings and they all get together and then i'm always on like i'm on zoom or on (laughs) i was going hi you know we've we've got countless kind of selfies of of the group where i'm on always on like this sort of screen Uh, yeah (laughs) you're 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 on you're the you're like they're holding up an ipad in front of you know (laughs) <laughs> oh, I know. It's such a shame. It was just really bad timing because obviously 2020 was 2020. And yeah. then 2021, you know, the conference in Vegas, the restrictions to the, from the UK to US were still in place. Sure. So they didn't lift until the following October. So I, could, I just couldn't get there in August. So yeah. Yeah, it was a real, real shame. So I am, I've, I've got like two conferences to make up for. So <laughs> it's gonna be the year <laughs> yeah i bet I, but i i was excited to see an international member on the board because i think yeah. it's important I, yeah, I, no, i've I even told it's... mary that i think the the ioc chair should be a board position and to, yeah, that, do, and, to and make sure that you always have international representation on the board yeah um, it's interesting you say that because that's one of the things that came out of the strategic meeting that Mary ran mm-hmm. last this time not well, a bit earlier this time last year and a lot of the feedback was that you know we really need to integrate the international aspect to everything that we do mm-hmm. you know it, it shouldn't necessarily be something that we do in isolation you know it's something that we need to embed in in our announcement in, in, in all of our committees and that's what we so over the last couple of months sort of really really tried to do and you know I'm just I'm so overwhelmingly proud of, of what we've achieved. You know, if I think back, you know, the work that Yarissa Walsh and Carl Stoker and Kim Barnes have done from a mm-hmm. partnerships and training and certification perspective, like where we are now. So we've got certification, both clear and leaf in Spanish. Mm-hmm. We've, we've had training webinars in Spanish. We've had, you know, actual training classes being delivered in Spanish now as well. And, you know, and it's just such you know, I, I know it's only Spanish and, and you know, we've mm-hmm. got other languages, but to achieve that, I just think it's, it's, it's huge, you know, because we do have a lot of Spanish speaking members and, you know, to be able to reach those and to enable them to sort of get the value from, from their membership and really then enable them to grow within the crime analysis discipline and then spread that word in, in their regions and, 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 like, and then across their agencies. I just think it's such you know, an, an amazing thing to have, have achieved. And we can only do that, as I say, by embedding these things in everything that we do. So, you know, we've got a phenomenal translation committee, you know, and Laura DeSero has got just like this wonderful team beneath her who are so responsive and so receptive to all of our sort of translation demands and everything else, because we all recognise that Google Translate has still got a bit of a way to go. So, yeah, she's she's just, she does an amazing job sort of coordinating, you know, all, all of their work. And, you know, we're now translating the publications, newsletters, and, and everything else and it's and our emails that well <laughs> when the when the forum works the emails that go out so you know we've, we've come a huge way in, in the last few years and I just see it, it's it's only going to grow from here you know we're not going to go backwards are we so yeah, yeah it's hugely yeah. exciting yeah well someday the the website issues will be in the rearview mirror they will and sooner rather than later <laughs> so <laughs> So, but you going into the conference, you have a, a goal in mind that you want to try to achieve. Oh, I just want to enjoy it. And I want to see everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, yeah. there were some really, really good speakers, actually. I was looking through the, the, the I know it's sort of subject to change, but I was mm-hmm. looking through the, you know, the, the proposed schedule the other day. And, you know, we've got some really great speakers, both keynote and, you know, through through the rest of the, the conference. I'm always so impressed with the diversity of speakers and the variety of topics that are, are selected. You know, we've from a keynote point of view, we've got, I think it's Rosanna Aranda. She's the founding executive, executive director of the University of Chicago Crime Lab. And she's done a load of work around improving the public sector's approach to public safety and education. I think that's going to be really interesting. And, I think it's the same with with Chief William Scott, who's from San Francisco Police Department. So he was previously at LAPD and he led them through a transformational progress. So I, you know, I'm really looking forward to hearing hopefully how you know crime analysis featured within that and hopefully sort of developed within this transformation. But I think the other thing that really you know fantastic for us and it's the first time we've done this is on the Wednesday of the conference we have a special guest Sergeant Devlin from Scottsdale PD and he's going to be talking about self-improvement by overcoming challenges and this is the first time that we've really addressed well-being at the conference 
And I think mm. this is a, it's a huge step for us. I think it's really, really positive. So yeah, I'm excited to hear that. And I'm looking forward to hearing Mindy. She's talking about a couple of things. I know she's talking about the analyst role in combating extremism. And Glenn's got a couple of good ones as well, because he's talking about school safety, which is obviously phenomenally topical and, and important and tackling misinformation, which I'm hoping is going to be all about OSINT. So, yeah. and we've got, we've got Spanish speakers as well. We've got members from Mexico and Ecuador speaking. So there's so much to look forward to. And I just hope I get to go to some of the sessions. I think being on the board is so, so busy very often we don't get to attend some of these in fact i think the last one i did go to which was in washington i don't think i attended anything <laughs> i wasn't uh, even on the board i yeah. was the chair of the international outreach and i just had so much going on i didn't actually attend anything so i'm kind of hoping that i do get the opportunity because there's there's so many good speakers that i really would like to to hear yeah so i definitely hope you get out and about a little bit so <laughs> thanks you all right. So since you're VP of membership, how many members currently with the IACA? Oh, we've, I, I know this because I ran it this morning. We have 4,833. <laughs> so, so it's phenomenal. So I'm super excited because we actually lost quite a lot of members at the start of COVID. So we dropped down. We Before COVID, we were sort of hovering around the four and a half thousand. And actually that at the time, that was the highest we we sort of we 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 highest number of members we'd had, but we lost a lot of you know agencies didn't renew during COVID, and that kind of broke my heart a little bit. And we kind of went we sort of hot we went to down below four thousand two hundred. I think we got to quite near four thousand at one point as well. But I am so happy to say, and it's a lot of it is thanks to the wonderful Christopher Bruce because we've now he's our sort of recruitment and retention sort of subcommittee chair, mm-hmm. and he's done a huge amount of work sort of targeting people who are due to renew, targeting people who have lapsed, targeting those who are part of regional associations, like dual members, but still haven't actually registered with us. And, you know, and those who, who have applied, but haven't sort of paid for their membership and that sort of thing. So we're now, we've, we're actually, yeah, we're up to 4,833, which is the largest membership we've, we've had. But we've challenged ourselves to reach 5,000 by the conference. <laughs> so if anyone's listening to this, if you're not yes. already a member, you'd make us super, 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 super happy if you joined or if you're last member please renew and contact me (laughs) vp-membership at (laughs) isca.net in the next week because we've not got long till conference (laughs) yes Yes, well very good help help the association out help rachel out achieve her her goal please (laughs) all right so well let's finish up with words of the world this is where i give the guests the last word and rachel you can promote any idea that you wish what are your words to the world Okay, so what I would say is to take every opportunity you can to learn and develop, take responsibility for your career development, and basically see every part of your career as a learning experience, you know, both the good and the bad, you know, sometimes, absolutely, we'll have to do things we don't like, we'll have to work with people that we don't like. And sometimes we'll encounter challenges and diversity, but we're in the fortunate position in that we have choices in how we respond to these types of adversity. We could let the bad or difficult times define us, or, you know, we could allow ourselves to see the positive and see the way in which we can learn from these experiences and grow in ourselves. You know, people will often ask me about what career choices they should make. And my answer will inevitably be that there's there's not often a wrong choice because whichever decision they make, they will learn something if they go in it with the right mindset and the right approach. So it's always about perspective, looking for the positive and being open to learning and growing and taking this forward. Very good. Well, I leave every guest with you. You've given me just enough to talk bad about you later. (laughs) But I do appreciate you being on the show, Rachel. Good luck getting to the conference. Hopefully it goes smooth, safe travels. Thank you so much for being here and you be safe. You're very welcome. Thank you very much, Jason. Take care. You too. Bye-bye now.